welcome back. Uh, let's continue our discussion on D-tubes and how I made them the way I made them and why I did what I did. So I got a little sample over here. Let me pull it over. This is a piece of D-tube uh, for the wingtips of my glider. And it's about six feet long, give or take. And as you can see, it's uh, carbon fiber on the inside. And this actually uses the spread toe carbon fiber on the inside. And it's three ounce uh, 120 cloth on the outside and Airx foam core. And I was telling you about the leading edges. And you can see it here. I have the uh, unidirectional carbon fiber is actually behind the fiberglass, but in front of the foam. And that gives me a rock solid leading edge that is highly resistant to damage. It's great. Didn't add very much weight at all. I used very lightweight unidirectional carbon fiber, and the resin that's already in the cloth was almost enough to wet it out. Had to add a little bit more. Um, now, the reason that this exists here, just sitting around, is that this was early in the manufacturing process. I was still sorting out the process, and I had some difficulties and so forth. This is just a really bad D-tube. Uh, there's voids on it. The surface is really rough. Uh, and when I pulled this one out, I thought, I'm never going to get this process to work. But I eventually did. So we got this one laying around as an extra. Now, um, a, a viewer uh, wrote in with a really excellent couple of questions uh, that get to, that they spotted something, they saw me doing something that's really unconventional. And uh, maybe other people have noticed it and haven't said anything. Uh, but this viewer says, geez, I've Better ask about that because he's out of his mind. <laughs> Maybe. He, they didn't actually say I'm out of my mind, you know, but it was kind of one of those little hair on fire kind of things because you don't do that. That's, that's not right. Uh, without, w in a very polite way, of course, because all my viewers are very, very polite. But I want to talk about it here because I'm going to show you in a moment um, the value of writing in the questions that you have. They're very important to me. And so far, I haven't ha ever had a set of questions come in or comment, and I said, oh, that's right, i got to go do that. No, a another strange thing happens. I said, why would they ask that question? Why, why, is, that, why is that important to them? What do they see that I don't see? Uh, no, I don't think they understand the concept quite right. Or, um, you know, oh, yeah, that's true, but, however, because I start going through that process, I start thinking, and forcing me to think my way through the rest of the problem is sometimes very beneficial. Um, and, and that's what happens in most of these cases. And I'm going to show you one of those examples right now because I always encourage people to write in. So his question was, Ronald, when you, when you mold these things, you're done. You're trimming them to shape. You cut the edge off. Yes. And then you don't do anything to seal that edge. It's not quite the way you put it, but that's what he was talking about. You leave that edge open, which is very true. On the panel here where I have a sample, this D-tube here has been trimmed off to fit, comes up on the spar, glues on, and the rear skins come in and just butt together. Uh, and that's generally considered a big no-no. Uh, because how do you carry the loads in the outer skin? And how do you get the loads in the outer skin? And isn't this edge that is not sealed just going to open up? Uh, when you put loads on it and you know he says you know traditionally you 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 taper the edges of the foam and you bring the inner layer together with the outer layer and they're bonded together to close off the edge and that is true that is very traditional and i'll show you one of my samples that i was working on years ago oh gosh maybe this is six years ago i was working on this one so you can see it right here where i've taken the inner layer of carbon fiber and I've ramped it down, and I've uh, bonded it directly to the outer layer, which in this case happens to be Kevlar. And then I'm playing with ideas for aft skin. What if I had just fiberglass that's open? Well, I discover you don't want that because it tears really easy. Oh, there goes my outer skin. There goes the stuff I'm flying on. That's a bad plan. Uh, even the Kevlar. You can just peel the Kevlar right off of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought, oh, I'll just bond a sheet of foam on the inside, and that'll keep it from tearing. Uh, but the foam cracks, and that's a problem. So you can see how I go through this. You know, it's like, oh, I got the sandwich panel working. This one's flat, but I can make it curve. And here I was testing peel strength. Going, oh, that Kevlar's bonded on there pretty good, peeling that off like that. 
And I did the traditional method here. Now, this is when I was working in female molds. I was planning on building this whole thing in female molds, but female molds that are made out of styrofoam, and they would have had an inside layer on them of mylar uh, to provide the smooth surface. Uh, long story short, much work never worked. Bad plan. Things would slide around in the mold. It was, it was awful. Um, good idea that was just... <laughs> couldn't execute on it. So I wanted to take a moment here in the middle of the video to uh, really explain why those questions are so important. So a as I thought through this whole uh, deal of, gosh, open edge, foam, shearing the foam, transferring the loads that way, you know, there, there is something to be said for that is risky, uh, unusual way of doing it. And uh, in the process of uh, uh, studying the foam and finding out what its shear strength is, and as I thought through this, I thought, oh, I got some of that miracle material out in the shop. Uh, it, it's, it's basically, it, some people would consider it like one of those unobtainium uh, type materials where it has miracle properties, solves all your problems in one fell swoop, uh, and all you have to do is know about it and, and apply it to your design and it solves all your problems. And, and I have a piece of unobtainium uh, type material right over here, and let me pick it up and show it to you. Balsa wood. <laughs> this is an amazing material. Really is. Been around for a long, long time. They used it on, uh, uh, the Wright brothers didn't use it, but they used it on the Spirit of St. Louis, uh, the wingtips, the wheel pants, not the wheel pants, but the strut coverings and so forth, were balsa wood, covered with fabric and dope. Um, and it, it is nature's original composite material. You have fibers running this way, they're glued together, um, and, and they're stacked in such a way that they're extra strong, and it's really light. You can get balsa wood down around six pounds, eight pounds per cubic foot. And you know what? It just, while well, I was thinking about this, like, wow, I can get balsa to the same thickness as my foam. And because I have changed the way that I'm making the D-tubes, I don't have to actually glue the balsa to the foam ahead of time. If you go watch the video on the, on the uh, D-tubes for the center section, and I show the new method, well, I'm butting the foam pieces together and then putting a piece of tape on here, and I've, I'm doing a two-step process. Tape on this side, turn it over, turn the whole thing over, glue on the fiberglass on the outside, cure all of that on the mold, and then when I'm done, go over down to the other side, remove the tape, and then do the skin on that side. And when I do this, the epoxy, because of the vacuum bag, actually gets forced into these joints. So I don't have to worry about gluing these ahead of time and making a really rough, crooked joint, trying to get it flat and sanded all that. And I thought, you know, I can just cut strips of balsa that are about an inch wide or an inch and a half wide. It's flexible enough to go around the mold at that point. It's pretty flat back here. And I'm building the D-tubes extra wide. So instead of having a open edge of foam off an open edge of balsa. And I thought, what's, what's the shear strength of balsa compared to foam? It's got to be better. You know? So if I put balsa in here, that's eight pounds per cubic foot. Okay, that's about double, a little more than double, two and a half times the density of the foam. But it's only a strip about an inch wide. An inch gives me plenty of variance for trim. No, somewhere in there, is, the trim line is going to be somewhere in there, and the balsa might be a quarter inch wide, might be half an inch wide, three quarters of an inch wide. Don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, I got the balsa in there. So I trim through the balsa. Just as easy. Do it with a knife. Uh, when I size the D-tubes, I just come in with a box cutter knife and I score the outer skin, go through the foam, score the inner skin, snap it off. Nice clean edge. I can do the same thing with balsa. Uh, and you know what? Balsa is actually cheaper than the foam. Why don't I use it for the whole D-tube? Too heavy, too uh, to, it won't go around the front curve, and, and we just can't stand having a core material that's six pounds per cubic foot, the glider would be too heavy. But for one strip along the edge, good compromise. So what's the shear strength on balsa? Wow, 120 PSI when I look it up. More than double what I'm getting out of the foam. So, wow, a little bit of extra weight. We're talking a couple ounces over the entire aircraft, maybe three ounces, and more than double the shear strength. 
So if there was any doubt as to whether there's enough shear strength on that open edge, balsa will solve that problem. In fact, when I go make the D-tubes, you'll eventually see a video of me making the D-tubes for the main wing panels, and you'll see me put balsa in. It's going to be cool. It'll be a great way to finish it off. And then after I cut the edge, I'll probably just go back with, I'll get my glove on, and I'll dip it in the epoxy, and I'll just rub the epoxy on the edge here uh, when we're gluing the D-tube on so that we'll have epoxy on this edge, and when it butts together with the aft skin, uh, we'll have a little glue in there just to keep it sealed off from the elements. And where I put the uh, covering material on, well, the covering will, will go over the top of it and protect it from the elements. So because that viewer uh, called me to task on doing something really unusual and finishing off the sandwich panel, made me think there's a better way to do it. And that's why I hope that you all send in your, your questions and comments and it'll get me to thinking, and I might think up a better way of doing it. So thanks to that viewer that sent in those questions, we're going to have better D-tubes for the main panels because of that question. So, uh, and, and now we'll uh, go back uh, to what I was talking about before, and I'll continue the discussion of these D-tubes.